everybody. It's good to be back. The prodigal daughter has returned. Um, and I'm happy to be here. I'm glad to see the fall history series uh, continuing uh, in the 12 years that I um, managed the Oakland History Center. Uh, one of the delights I had was uh, putting on programs where the community could share their love of history with other members of the community. So Emily and Aaron, thank you. And Tyler, thank you for uh, putting continuing this and also for welcoming me back to participate in it. We have a chair. Living on borrowed time. Time waits for no man. A stitch in time saves nine. Time in a bottle. Turn back the hands of time. Time is on my side. In the nick of time. Killing time. Tonight's theme is time. Our guests have each presented us with unique works that investigates time's hold on us, our acknowledgement and manipulation of it, our attempts to control it, and our inexplicable connection to it. Andrew Alden has given us uh, an approachable, engaging, often poetic history of Oakland's geology and how it's marked the city we know. Jenny O'Dell has given us a thought experiment that will be discussed, I'm sure, for generations. Jenny O'Dell is a multidisciplinary artist and author. Her first book, How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy, was widely praised and a New York Times bestseller. Her new book, Saving Time, Discovering a Life Beyond the Clock, has been called subversive, hopeful, rigorous, and compassionate. It is an ambitious book that I think readers, philosophers, and time management gurus will be talking about for years. Andrew Alden is a geologist and a geoscience writer who has worked for the U.S. Geological Survey and has reported for KQED and Bay Nature. Since 2007, he has written the popular blog, Oakland Geology, on which his first book, Deep Oakland, How Geology Shaped a City, is based. In it, he examines not only the physical nature of Earth, but the human relationship, our human relationship with geology, from Ohlone times to the present, reminding us that we don't merely live on the Earth, but with it. Please welcome our guests. Oh, okay, thank you. And, and as long as we're throwing out time quotes, we've got Henry David Thoreau saying, Time is but the stream I go a fishing in. And we have Walt Whitman, who said, My foothold is tenoned and mortised and granite, and I know the amplitude of time. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, um, the, the, my book has 11 chapters and I don't get into rocks until chapter 9. <laughs> so that's just to say, you know, geology is, is more than rocks, it's a lot more than rocks. But when I get to it, I get to it in chapter 9, which is about Sibley Volcanic Preserve, and specifically the South End. And uh, it goes a little like this. A little higher on the trail, past a cattle gate, a knob of rock peers down from a cluster of oaks. Broken bits have tumbled to the roadway. Many of the bits are whole pebbles, the size of eggs and buckeye conkers, polished like river rocks, but stained with age. I can't resist hefting one in my hand. The outcrop in the oaks is studded full as a fruit cake with these pebbles, a thousand-eyed century. It's a type of rock made of stones encased in a hard matrix of fine-grained sand, conglomerate. 
To me, this knob has a familiar face. It's one of a widespread set of outcrops in these hills, known to geologists as the Orinda Formation. Conglomerate looks like concrete made by someone who's only read about it. <laughs> this lack of artifice marks it as a natural product. Conglomerate was not meant to be concrete, nothing meant to be anything. It's the petrified twin of a modern gravel bed at the bottom of the sea. It represents a gravel bed environment that existed in the geologic past. It tells me a geological short story, a cycle of events that began long before this October afternoon. We wrote this in October 2019. This fossil pebble, preserved from Miocene times, is a sample of an ancient mountain in an ancient landscape. One of the things I love about geology is that it retrieves lost lands. This inarticulate pebble shows directly what kind of rock the Miocene highland was made of. Indirectly, it hints at mountains before those mountains. Now, for an instant, it warms to the sun and the touch of a living thing. One could say it went to sleep in one world and awoke in another. The top of the valley, where the trail turns north along Gutty Ridge, is a good place to try the mental exercise I've mentioned before, to look at this landscape and picture its changing appearance over Oakland's history. This was a vibrant neighborhood when Europeans first came into the country. The tribes came to pick mushrooms in winter, tend useful plants with fire, harvest game animals in the meadow, and catch salmon in the creek. When wildflowers bathed these hills in color every spring and summer, the tribes knew the virtues of every species, but surely too they were pleased and awed by the kaleidoscopic bloom. Now, let's look a little farther back to the dawn of human presence. Since the last ice age reached its maximum, some 20,000 years ago, these hills have changed costume several times. At first, they wore a cool green savanna, then temperate zone forest and chaparral as the ice age faded and the first humans arrived via northern Asia. <coughs> As century followed century and the climate warmed and dried, these tribal cultures learned to optimize the grasslands ecosystem and themselves for mutual well-being. The coat of many colors the tribes perfected was perhaps the hill's finest outfit. To the geologist, the changes that swept this landscape since the glass, last glacial maximum are as fleeting as the shadows of clouds. Human time is pitifully short. Geologic time is dizzyingly different. To geologists, a million years is not quite a snap of the fingers, more like the tick of a clock. Gaze through so much time and even the rarest events thousand-year floods, great earthquakes, century-long droughts are part of a continuum. Clashes of continents, oscillations of ice ages, and monster impacts from space are part of the mix of rare events. In the geologic present, they, not everyday events, are what really shape the world. In the finger snap of time since the last glacial maximum, beneath its changing costumes, the land has looked the same. Geologists, with their million-year vision, watch water and gravity cut the land down and see it rising up for more. This world consists of remnants of different, much earlier ones. The pebbles in the conglomerate have told us so. Now we're getting somewhere. Thank you, Andrew. So I want to start by asking, you, you started this as a part of a blog. And how did you know you had a book? All around, around post number 400 or so. <laughs> you know, I just 
uh, I just never ran out of things to say, and I thought, well, there's stuff that a blog isn't right for. I think I'll just uh, melt it all down, turn it into a book, and it doesn't work that way. You need to start from scratch when you write a book. And so every, every word in this has never appeared in the blog. If you follow the blog, this is all new. Oh, good. The publisher wanted me to say that. You know, <laughs> the that. Uh, well, I'm happy to report uh, Andrew's uh, book has gone into a second printing. We have the same publisher, Heyday of Berkeley. And um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the book. I thought it was... Um, you made me completely interested in geology, which I have to say, I've only been very vaguely interested in geology. It's like, oh, look at this, you know, strata of rocks, interesting, and just keep going. But now I have an understanding of it. And But what amazes me about geologists is that they have such a capacity to understand time by millions and millions of years, which to me is kind of inconceivable, you know, to kind of, I've, I've forgotten all of my Miocene and all those little things we learned in fifth grade, but um, just to be able to kind of capture that. But I want to ask you about uh, the fa what made you decide in the book to include, I appreciated it, what made you include uh, the, the, a conversation about the study of geology and how it's evolved over the years? I thought that was great because you're talking about our uh, geological evolution as an area, but you're also giving us an idea of how the discipline of geology has changed over time. What, what made you feel that that was important to add? Well, you know, I've spent my life in geology, and geology has a bad reputation. Geology has a dry reputation. Geology has a, has a history um, and I spell it out right in the introduction. You know, ge geologists were part of uh, white hegemony. Ge geologists are part of civilization. Geologists are part of everything the civilization has done wrong, as well as what every uh, what civilization has done right. Um, you know, um, we have. Um, the Iron Age, the Bronze Age, those were all based on geologic resources. The Stone Age was, you know, it's geology is more than most people think. And, um, um, uh, and, and the other thing is that um, I, I was simply, I couldn't help it, you know, as I was writing the book. You have to get into everything. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I didn't want to talk about geology. I wanted to talk about Oakland. This is really a love letter to Oakland. Um, you know, I want Oakland to realize what a beautiful place it is and why it's so beautiful and, and how it's so beautiful and, um, uh, and, and why it affected the way the city has laid out, the way the city has grown, the way the, the, way the, um, the things that irritate us about the city uh, are, 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 you know, they just, they're the accidents of decisions that people made, you know, 150 years ago and the, and the Spanish 200 years ago and 10,000 years ago. And um, I just wanted to add that fourth dimension the fifth dimension, really, you know, the fourth dimension is human history, and the fifth dimension is geologic history. Thank you. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and start talking to Jenny. Um, I enjoyed your book. I learned a lot in your book. And um, at the beginning of your book, you introduced to us um, these two concepts of Kronos and Kairos. And, and I, it seems the way I read it, it seems like these are the hooks on which the rest of the book is hanging from. And can you talk to us about that and why you felt like 
these two things are kind of essential to the, uh, our understanding of the rest of the book? Yeah, yeah so uh, Kronos and Kairos are based on two um, ancient Greek words for time. Um, Kronos, you can think of chronological. Um, it's sort of more linear time. I would say like the time of the historical timeline or maybe even everyday time. Um, whereas Kairos, is, my understanding of it, is much more... Um, sort of like active, like a moment of, of interruption, something that's maybe very dynamic or even violent um, and w- in which something is being created. And I, I had noticed when I was starting to research the book that a lot of people who write about climate, uh, the climate crisis and also climate grief and climate anxiety have um, drawn on Kronos and Kairos as a useful distinction because Kronos being the sort of linear uh, one of those two, really that understanding of time or that way of thinking about time really lends itself to um, declinism and deterministic ways of thinking like I, I today is the same as tomorrow is the same as the next day and it's going to be like this forever. And uh, even though I wrote the proposal for this book before the pandemic, it was written during the pandemic. So um, I was very familiar with that feeling of time um, versus Kairos, um, which you know, is that kind of moment, that feeling that actually that that timeline has broken and there's an interruption and something unexpected is about to happen that you, you need, that's the seize the time kind of uh, version of time. So um, I'm really kind of trying to rescue Kairos in the book, the, the title Saving Time, as I mentioned in the introduction, um, you know, like my last book, How to Do Nothing, it's not actually about how to do, to, not, it's not about doing nothing. Um, saving time is not about saving, it's not time management advice. Um, it's about um, saving a sense of time from despair, from optimization, from the idea that time's money, um, what have you. And so that um, in that distinction, I'm really I'm, I'm gunning for the for Kairos. But uh, I do talk a, a lot about both. Like the first part of the book is really the, the history of like how we kind of came to see time as money and as this more kind of Kronos stuff. And then the second part of the book is really searching for cues around us and ways of seizing upon that kind of Kairos understanding of time. Yeah, you talk a lot in the book about capitalism and labor and exploitation of workers and how all of that, or at least the way we practice capitalism, uh, impacts how we interpret leisure and how we go about our lives as workers. Uh, I thought that was some of the more interesting parts of the book is talking about um, not only our work lives versus our leisure lives and how we kind of have to steal leisure time away because we're working in this linear capacity of, you know, it's Monday through Friday, you've got to go to work, and then, you know, maybe you get two weeks vacation in your in your year or something like that. So um, I could really relate to that. <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask you, you know, the way we, what both of you had in your books Uh, conversations about uh, or examinations of capital or or capitalism and, and, you know, so much of the city uh, that Andrew uh, tells us about in his book uh, is uh, these are commercial decisions that were made that really form the way our city is built and where things are and everything like that. And then in your book, uh, you do spend a lot of time talking about capitalism. I thought another interesting notion that you bring up is the de-skilling of workers. Uh, that really hit me because um, it was talking about, you know, Andrew just used the word hedge money, and it was talking about the primacy of the people with capital, the, the bosses, the executives, the class, versus the workers who are making the products. Um, and so I, I that hit me in both books. I love that. I, lo- I loved your part. It, it really... You know, because we swim in time, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, Time is what allows us all to get together, you know, in one place tonight. But um, it's it's like 
you made us fish aware of the water we're swimming in and, and how bizarre it is and how I like that. Yeah, and thank you. And um, I, I uh, so I live in Grand Lake, um, which means that during the pandemic, when I would go on my endless pandemic walks, um, I would sometimes wander up into Piedmont. And when I was reading the parts about Piedmont in your book, um, I think there's actually something really analogous there where it's like, oh, the wealth of Piedmont actually is related to like the Piedmont in the name Piedmont, <laughs> you know, like the quarries. Um, but I think that that's um, like I've had a similar experience just um, in a more like immediate physical sense from reading your book of like the things again that we take for granted like the the landscapes that we walk around the, the fact that things are sort of shaped a certain way um, I think it can be it can become so familiar that it kind of takes a lot to dislodge someone from that and I feel like what I was kind of trying to do in my book was like you know I think I was just sort of sitting there thinking long enough about like the idea of selling time, the idea of selling your time. And like, that's just so familiar to us now. It's like, you know, the, the transition between chapter one and chapter two of my book are like moving from like basically plantations and factories to like ourselves. Um, and how, like when I think about my time, I see money. Um, and obviously that is a necessity for most people, but also it kind of goes even, I feel like further into our psyches than is strictly speaking necessary. Um, so I think that I, I was kind of pursuing a similar project of defamiliarization. You, you did that well. Um, I also, speaking of time, I also felt very triggered while reading your book because it was I was thinking about um, how I interpret time and how I now that I'm not working and on a you know 37 and what is it 37 and a half hour work week. Thank you, Oakland Public Library, um, <laughs> for those two and a half hours uh, of free time. Um, but um, I, I was just, I realized, and my husband and I talked about it, he's like, what is happening right now with you with this book? And, I, and then I realized I'm, I'm kind of being triggered because it's reminding me of what I do with time. You talk about, in the book, time, you know, the sharing of time. I forget what chapter that's in, but you know how you can make time by making time for other people, um, which I love. I love that idea. I love that notion. But um, I was triggered by the fact that I recognized or I was reminded that I'm such a clock watcher. And even in retirement, I'm a clock watcher. It's like, I'm going to do this task for half an hour. And I can almost feel when half an hour is up. That's how regimented my life has become. And um, I don't know. It was um, triggering, but informative. I, <laughs> I mean, maybe it'll make you feel better to know that, like, I mean, so... You know, I, I like I said in that transition between chapter one and chapter two, it's sort of like uh, this this internalization of things like Taylorism, right? And, and I am obviously in the book don't really come out as like a fan of Taylorism, but I I do think that um, you know I'm not a fan of Taylorism as it's normally um, put to use, right? And sort of devaluing people's work or taking control over their work away from them, but it as just like a system of coordinating actions or measuring time like I don't actually have anything against looking at the clock or measuring time like as you know this is own thing and I actually when I was doing um an event in um, in New York when my book came out, uh, I needed to tell the venue how early I wanted to arrive, and it was based on the number. I had to sign a bunch of books before the event, and I was trying to figure it out with my boyfriend, and he's like, okay, he's like, let's time it. Like, this is Taylorism, okay? Um, and, he's, and so I, like, sat at the hotel desk, and he's like, okay, start. And like, I, like, took the book, opened it, signed it, like, put it aside. It's five seconds. And then we multiplied five seconds by the number of books, and that's when I arrived at the venue. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, tough. I had a similar experience. You know, we, quick, we were at this event with a bunch of publishers, sign these 50 handout copies, and quick, you know, sign them, sign them. It's like saying the same word 50 times at the end. I'm going, How, what's my name? <laughs> How do I spell my last name? <laughs> yeah, so I, will, I just say that because I, I think, you know, as a tool, you know, like obviously, just even collectively, right? Like we need 
we need calendars and clocks to be able to coordinate our activities with each other. I feel like the, the problem only arises when that's you know joined to exploitative systems, but also when it becomes the, what you think time is fundamentally. So. Yeah, it's very meta. The, your examination of the book is very meta, and, um, and and I found it challenging. Yeah, hopefully in a good way. <laughs> in a good way. I mean, I learned something. I learned a lot, actually. I, um, I found it challenging. I found it challenging the way Marshall McLuhan is challenging. Exactly. Those. Both of them are kind of a collage of. Because it's such a, a, a vague thing, time, and you have to sort of surround it with pieces of ideas. And so it reminded me a lot of McLuhan. Of course, he had he had a you're a whole new generation of of, of things to paste around this thing. And I said, well, it's it's just great. It's a new uh, iteration of a great project, you know. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good way to put it. It is kind of like a pastiche of all these mm -hmm. um, theories, concepts, uh, practices of time. Um, one thing I wanted to, one thing I really, really appreciated about the book was uh, your connecting race and gender and ability, physical ability, uh, and how all of those identities complicate our con our concept of time, or or we're impacted by um, time. Am I saying that right? Um, you know, given your race, you know, you uh, use quotes from like Fred Moten's. Um, he says uh, Fred Moten, I know as a as a poet, actually, but he's also uh, a, crit uh, a critical cultural thinker. And um, so you you talk about race and gender and ability and social status and the impact, how it impacts one's relationship to time. And you mentioned uh, not only Fred Moten, but uh, Brittany Cooper's uh, statement about white people owning time. Uh, and that, that I thought was really, really interesting, and I could absolutely relate to it. Uh, and Fred Moten saying, uh, the settler bringing the center with him. Uh, that hit me really hard, too, because it's kind of like... Um, uh, I, th I think people of color learn that really early, um, of the concept of time that, um, well, probably the first thing we learn is that there's colored people time and then there's white people time. Has anybody heard of that? <laughs> right on. Somebody has <laughs> heard um, And so, you know, uh, different cultures have a completely different uh, set of time, an idea of time. And uh, But when you're living in a society where there is a dominant, to get back to Andrew's word, hegemonic, uh, idea of time, you're always judged against that standard, right? And then the Fred Moten thing about the settler, I mean, white people, bringing the center with them in this almost as a mutual kind of way where you're the center and everything goes out from you um, based on your standards. I thought that was interesting and definitely worth investigating, which you did a lot to quote uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates and, and his talk about that. Can you talk about it a bit? Yeah, so I think there are two kind of ways that that comes into the book that are really important. And one is sort of granular every day and the other is more historical. So on the level of the everyday, um, if you think about the typical time management self-help book, let's say, um, I mean, going back decades, they kind of, I looked at a lot of them and they, they often, um, their advice involves making a grid. <laughs> Um, as soon as they even give you the grid, um, and they say log your log your activities in this grid, kind of do like a time audit, see where you're wasting your time, kind of squeeze it harder, more efficiently, and like you will have more time. Um, and so that's you know that's kind of in the beginning of chapter two, and then the rest of the chapter is like all of the ways in which that doesn't make any sense. Um, and all you need to do is ask anyone who doesn't have control or privilege with regards to their time for any number of reasons because they don't they're not at the top of the hierarchy the top of the hierarchy being yeah basically uh 
uh, not only white people, but people like uh, in modern times, which I also talk about in the book, uh, the, the boss who's shown at the very beginning versus Charlie Chaplin on the assembly line, um, you know, the, or the idea men, as they're kind of described, like someone who has full control over their time, um, other people's time exists at their disposal. So even if you're, let's say, not on the clock um, or even just within the home, for example, you are expected to speed up or slow down for other people. Um, and so once you kind of look at it that way, it becomes clear that your experience of time is very much related to your race, class, ability. Um, there's also some stuff at the end of the book um, drawing from disability studies about time where obviously um, someone who's disabled is inhabiting a temporal world that was not built for them um, in so many ways. And so, but then they also, uh, like anyone who is not at the center, um, their perspective their perspective gives us the chance to ask like whether this system of time is humane for anyone. Um, and so that's kind of like on the the everyday level. And then historically, um, there's also a lot in the beginning of the book about just kind of the evolution of the system of time that we have, which is basically a history of colonialism. Um, and yeah, the, the book that I cite the most is a, a cultural history of temporal practices basically being exported from Britain to Australia and um, South Africa, parts of South Africa, and just these kind of like surreal um, anecdotes in which people are having conversations where they do not have the same understanding of time, or people who are outside of the audible range of the mission bell, for example, being like, I don't know what a Sabbath is and I don't care. Um, and so this, these kinds of clashes, right? Um, and they, and I think they kind of survive in, in interesting ways. Like one of the things that I, I talk about later in the book is Filipino time. Um, and I, according to my family, people that I asked, um, Filipino time is one hour late, <laughs> um, compared to, I guess, white, white people time, <laughs> um, one to two hours late. Um, and as I mentioned, if, everyone at a party is on Filipino time. It's just time. Um, and nobody's late. Nobody's late. But also, I think this kind of gets at the tension. Um, I also quote a Filipino graphic designer, freelancer, who is like out there on the global market, right? Um, and he you know, writes this essay saying, like Filipino time is a ba is bad branding for us. Like we look unpunctual um, on the marketplace. And so you can see that kind of like, like there's this tension throughout the book of these like trying to maintain these pockets of like other understandings of time and they're all kind of existing under the pressure of capitalism and these other structures of power that everyone is existing in. Interesting. Um, I'm going to switch over to Andrew. I was curious to know, one thing I, of course, loved about your book was all the history that you shared with us. Um, and I'd uh, be interesting to know, what was your favorite discovery as you're, you know, basically writing from scratch and not from a blog? Uh, I just loved combing through old newspapers. Um, you, you really got a sense and it particularly uh, made me, made the uh, part of Jenny's book about Taylorism, which is basically, you know, analyzing people on assembly lines so that they work as absolutely as efficiently as possible, you know, down to, you know, do you wipe your nose? Or, you know, just, it's just How many nuts. seconds does that take? And, away and you look at in the old newspapers, you know, 100 years ago, they, they were all about this, so making the best of your time. You know, it was all the real estate. Um, you know, we're opening up a new tract of homes, and you'll want to buy them. They'll they'll be twice as valuable in a year from now, and you'll be so you have all this wealth. And I've gone, yeah, dollars and minutes, and and the uh, and the uh, and and of course, you know, I look at the landscape, and as I was saying in my reading, you imagine it how it used to be to the previous waves of people. The Mexican ranchers, you know, they were going well. It's their their calendar was well, maybe maybe the religious calendar because they were Catholics. But there was there was branding time and there was calving time. You know, that was their business. And before that, we had the Ohlones, and the Ohlones had, you know, I haven't I haven't talked to them in detail, but I just know they would have. You know, this is this is uh, root harvesting time. This is 
you know, time to uh, harvest basket weaving supplies. This is time to make new boats. That's what's their calendar. That you know, you wake up every day and they're in, they have no clocks. And so, to this day, the indigenous people talk about Indian time. You know, and it's the same kind of thing. Well, you know, we're on Indian time. We don't, we don't hurry up. We don't hurry up. And, and I, think, I think all of the underclasses have that as a defensive mechanism. You know, we don't have to hurry up. It's an act of rebellion. Yeah, we don't have to hurry up anymore. Yeah. And that lasts for generations. And I'm going, that's really cool. And that's interesting to see. Um, okay, I'll remember that next time I'm yeah. to something. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, if, and my own person, you know, I, I kind of bucked the trend when I was at the U.S. Geological Survey. The minute I got a 20% raise, I said, I want a 32-hour week now. I want to work four days a week. <laughs> that was my attitude. So I am definitely, you know, I'm, I'm an old hippie. I've been, definitely been off that treadmill, too. Good for you. <laughs> uh, what else did I want to say? I wanted to ask you so many questions. I want to uh, talk to you both about, uh, you know, we're all Oakland writers now. I'm proud to join your group. Um, but uh, I wanted to ask you, how has being an Oakland resident informed your writing, if at all? I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have written this if I hadn't lived in Oakland. You know, no? Oakland. It's. Uh, well, I moved here because I knew it was a, a cool city, and I moved here. It was in October in 1989, and I remember my wife and I walking down Broadway, just looking around. You know, we lived in Concord before, out, out in the burbs. We had identical houses around us, and you go to Oakland, and there's. There's, there's buildings, you know, <laughs> buildings, <laughs> you know, in buildings and, in and so, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's big old things with, you know, they were built a hundred years ago and they're still here. And, and then two weeks later, the, uh, the Loma Prieta earthquake happened and everything changed. And I wasn't really thinking about geology at the time. I, of course, I did. Um, <clears throat> I had the geologist detachment. When we when we experienced earthquakes, we're going, oh, okay, there's another one. Even the big ones, we go, well, yeah, there's another one. And then after after that, just like everyone else, we suffer and grieve and and feel terror. Um, so, yeah, Oakland was definitely marked at that time. And then, you know, I, I hung out here, I explored the city, and I realized this place has fascinating geology. I found it discovered a bedrock map of the city, and I'm going, this thing is a crazy quilt of stuff. I want to check it all out. So I would not have written this book if I lived anywhere else. And um, it was just a joy from beginning to end, weaving the human history and the geologic history. I, I learned so much, and so that's what I want. I want everybody to share. I want all of Oaklanders to feel as amazed as I do as, at this place. So, well, yeah. you know, it not only reads as a history book and a history of geology, the field itself, but it also, you know, I could see myself, because it's a perfect size book, um, I could see myself definitely carrying it with me. You know, it's just like this could be like a field guide almost. <laughs> But and you also write so lovely. If you have it on your phone, city. you could do that. <laughs> or is it going to be an audio book? Yeah, Maybe? yeah, um, the audio book. Well, no, no, sorry, the the ebook. The ebook. The ebook. All the notes in the back. I've got a whole bunch of links, you know, and they all work. And so the book, you read the book, you've got to type them all in, and it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was fascinating, and it made me want to, I mean, it has some of my favorite places in here, like Mountain View Cemetery and, and Redwood Park, but, um, you know, the whole Leona Heights, which I live near, and I've only been to Sibley a few times. I wanted to go back. It, it's, it was very... Uh, fetching, 
the book, I found the book very fetching. Mm. It's just like, let's go and mm. see something. I love that stuff. word. Yeah. <laughs> um, what about you? Yeah, so I, um, I mean, I think all of my work kind of runs on the assumption that it matters where you are. Um, and so, you know, how to do nothing. I don't think How to Do Nothing, my first book, would have been written without the existence of the Oakland Rose Garden. Um, I'm not just saying that. I, I, I think it just kind of grew out of that place. Mm. Um, and I always feel kind of weird when I have to do press for things that I wrote and, I, and I'm being interviewed and I'm like, I feel like somehow the place needs to be interviewed. <laughs> like they should interview the mountain or they should interview like all of the people that I talk to. Um, and so I really... Um, even when I'm not mentioning local things outright, it's just in everything. It's like all of the thoughts that I have are thoughts that I could only have here. Um, but there's also more specific things. Um, you and I both love Walden Pond. Um, yes. I live very close to Walden Pond books. And uh, early on, especially when I was writing How to Do Nothing, um, the, the kind of the curatorial uh, vibe of that store has been very uh, influential for me. Um, so many things that I bought there ended up in my work later. Um, and in this, in Saving Time, I actually structured the book as a one-day road trip. So every chapter takes imaginatively takes place in a different location in the Bay Area, um, kind of like as if you and I are in my <laughs> janky high school car that I no longer have an Oakland, but still own. Um, and we're like stopping in different places and, and looking at um, the marks of different understandings of time. And so chapter one is in the Oakland port. Um, because, it, was, it was great. I enjoyed that so much. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but not only because I'm talking about industrial time. So obviously, you know, there's the, the shipping port, but the fact that you can stand in Middle Harbor Shoreline Park and, and see the shipping containers and then turn around and see the migrating shorebirds and just like those two two understandings of time and those two kind of like uh, large circuits of movement. Um, and so that's, again, like I really feel like I took that from that place. And so it goes all the way out to Pescadero and then you turn around and you come back. So you end in Mountain View Cemetery. One of my favorite places. And of course you, Dorothy, you, you, you spent so much your formative years in East Oakland and West Oakland. Mm -hmm. And it was just really neat to read that part too. Oh, thank you. Just, you know, because you know, it's, 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 we recognize it now, and it was neat to see how it was then. You know. Yeah, I, I wanted to represent Oakland, because I have a great fondness for Oakland. I've lived here the better part of 50 years. And, um, and there's a lot about Oakland that doesn't get written about at all, not even negatively. It just... It's kind of like it doesn't exist. And, and for me, so much of my childhood um, was at a, at a time and a place where it was very vibrant. And, you know, I loved being in East Oakland when I was in East Oakland. I loved, you know, living on the edge of downtown Oakland and going to all the theaters and, you know, just rabble rousing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, Manhattan authors talk all about Manhattan, you know, so exactly. I, I, I would love the world to just come to Oakland and feel like they already know the place, you know, because yeah. they read Oakland yeah. authors. I'm glad we're all Oakland authors. Yeah. Um, what would you like, what messages or lessons would you like your readers to take away from your book, if any? Um, I think, you know, to go back to that grid image, um, any, anything, um, I, I would hope that the reader could come away with a sense of time that is just anything but that. <laughs> um, and so a counter example that I give later in the book is of uh, a friend of mine who was growing some lettuce and gave and wanted to give me some lettuce. And I'm basically like, oh, I don't want to take your lettuce because you'll have less. And she's like, no, 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 I have to give you the lettuce. I have to take the leaves off the outside so it keeps growing in this preferential way. And that, like, this very simple conversation that I had with her, I realized that I have, like, no mental mechanism for thinking about anything other than the zero-sum game. <laughs> like, if you give me something, you have less and I have more. Um, and it's something that she and I talked about. We also talked about beans. She was giving me these beans from a bean farm that doesn't exist anymore. Um, and we were like, wow, like, a bean has the past and 
the future in it, you know. Um, and I, I also mentioned that I, I after she gave me those beans, I, I Googled whether you could plant store-bought beans, and apparently you can sometimes, which just blew my mind. So anyway, these are just examples of, um, you know, like a different way of thinking about increase, I guess, um, that like, as I put in the book, like the more, sometimes the, the best way for you to get more time is to give it to me and vice versa. Um, and that's such a different conception of time and of events. I mean, if you think about the things, maybe, you know, some something small, that someone did for you a really long time ago doesn't really like quote unquote flower until much later in your life, but it's huge, you know? Um, and so it's a, it's a more complex way of thinking about time. But I think that when you can look at it through that lens, it, it, it makes me feel excited about what kinds of increase are possible. Um, I mean, I'm really excited about all the labor news that's been going on right now. Um, just like seeing that, Oh yeah. Like if you, if you turn around from the, like, I need to make my time, use my time more efficiently. If you turn around from that, you kind of just look around at all of the other people who are also struggling and what is possible. If you, if you pull your time or you start thinking about your collective time, what is actually possible for everyone who's involved in that constellation. So I guess that's, yeah, my hope is that someone would, would come away from the book thinking like less about like your little your box of 24 hours that gets refilled every day and more about this kind of network that you're in with other people in which you're all inhabiting the same time and um, for me um, like I said this I want Oakland to learn um, this new dimension of our familiar city. Um, and also, you know, knowing it will help us as we face the future. Um, just knowing what the past has been, what, what human beings have done with this landscape, uh, and we can make it better, especially knowing what's underneath it. Uh, you know, we say, you know, this is the first day of the rest of your life. This is the first year of the next 500, you know. <laughs> we're we're going we're to be here. If we're going to be here for forever, and I hope we are, we need to get, you know, moving. <laughs> so what's next for you, in writing-wise? Are you working on a new project? <clears throat> um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm still kind of coming down from the first book, and it's 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 a, a San Francisco Chronicle bestseller. Yes, you know, it my is. first book is yes, a bestseller. Is. Uh, it, it's gone into a second printing. Yes, you know, it has. It's earned out and it's it's advanced. <laughs> I'm going to get royalties next year, and I'm going. I don't. I don't know if I want to risk a sophomore slump. <laughs> You, you know, to. I want to quit. Maybe I should quit while I'm ahead. So I, I do have some ideas. I have an idea. It's, it's this project that's been tickling me for a long time. And it has sort of rich little ideas hooked up to it. I have all these rocks, you know. I collect rocks. And after a while, a few years ago, I looked at them and I said, uh, I, I, I collected this rock to be part of a... Uh, it was, a, it was a collection of rocks I was giving to the Chabot Observatory because they had that. And this was an extra one, and it was sitting there. And I said, you know, I feel bad about collecting this rock. I'm going to put it back. I'm going to put it back. And so I did that. Now, two years later, I drove, I drove over there. It was up west of Copperopolis, a, a spot by the road. It was that old um, slate quarry. And I put it back. <laughs> you know, I, I have this rock I picked up in Hawaii, and it's supposed to be bad luck. It's supposed to be bad luck to You're carry right. rocks on hey, Hawaii, and I thought, I am a geologist, you know, I can do that. <laughs> and then I thought, 
maybe all this time, you know, since 1975, I've been having bad luck. <laughs> well, life has been bad. I better put, you know, so that's, that's a project. Okay, I have a question for you. Later. Here's my layman's question, and I, no shade to geologists in the room. Um, do geologists have a preference as to where they practice or teach geology? Like, are there, you know, once you graduate from, you know, geology school, uh, do you, are there places in the world or America that you feel like, oh yeah, I got to go there because their rocks or their geology is more interesting than, say, the Bay Area or we, we, the Appalachians we, oh, we, or We want to like see that. the whole world. We have never run out of places to see. And after you've seen a lot of rocks, Every place is interesting, even you know the middle of Nebraska, yeah, or or Grand Rapids, Michigan, you know, <laughs> or the mounds of Illinois. Yeah. Um, and where you teach, that's entirely, you know, that's entirely up to the quality of the faculty, you know, the support you get, the quality of students. Okay. That that's really primary, uh, and your research field is in the Himalaya, you know, someplace like that. All the folks at UC Berkeley, yeah, they, they love being at Berkeley, but when they go out in the field, they go out to Nevada, or they go out to Tibet, or, you know, Antarctica, or wherever. They don't, they don't like books about their backyard. So I, you know, made a point of doing that, because mm -hmm. they're not going to do that. That's true. And, and I wish, and I hope that Deep Oakland is actually a new kind of book. I want someone who is in love with their own city, geologists who are in love with their own city. I want to see deep LA. I want to see deep San Francisco. I don't have to write it myself. And hey, Dave, would love it if I would do that because it could be a cool, you know, they said LA's got four, 20 times the market that Oakland does. <laughs> <laughs> it does. So we're going to um, open it up can for I, audience. Can you say one oh, thing sure. really quick? Because um, I just have to mention that in chapter four of my book, there's when you get to Pescadero, there's a description of a beach with pebbles on it, and there's a bunch of pebbles in the middle of the page. I just want everyone to know that this is who I asked about the, what those pebbles were. <laughs> okay. Like many silly questions from me, like interdisciplinary interloper at all times. I'm just like, please help me. What are these rocks? <laughs> so there is like a direct connection between our books. Yeah. I just wanted to very mention good, that. Very yeah. good. Um, let's open it up to questions. Um, what are the what are we gonna do? We're gonna have people walk up to the mic. Hello everyone. So um, we're gonna have people who wanna ask a question come up to the mic. So can I ask you two to move your chairs up to the front? So if you wanna ask a question, if you can line up like That's here. A lot of And we're doing that because we're filming. Yes. <laughs> so while we're waiting for someone to be the very first question asker, um, I want to say there is our books for sale at the back corner. And after Q&A, um, our authors will be up here signing books. Uh, so if you brought one, you want to buy one tonight. And you're all set. So. Hello, this mic's a little low for me. Um, <laughs> uh, so, I have not read Deep Open yet, but I definitely am after this. is amazing. Um, you talked a lot about how, as we've been going through generations, how kind of like new things that we have to think about regarding time have been kind of added on and piled on, kind of like that conglomerate you were talking about. How do you personally take back your time in reference to like all these new things that have been added on, or is that just like part of the aging that's just like not part of the I'm not really sure what your question is. <laughs> or was that question for Jenny? I, it, it, I, I think it's partially for both, just because it's like, yeah. Yeah, because I, th I think, yeah, you were saying that, like, you know, because 
I'm coming at it from like currently, like the kind of the pieces that I use and the kind of like references that I use are more recent. I mean, I'm very proud that I have a Beavis and Butthead citation in my book. Um, but <laughs> um, but uh, I guess um, so there's that, right? Like I'm younger, so like the references that I use are, are and I also just li- I just like doing that aesthetically. I like mixing things that are current and contemporary with o- much older things. Um, but I think also um, I like I personally was trying to connect these, you know, like long historical things to like very contemporary experiences, like what social media does to your sense of time, for example, or like I have a whole, um, kind of section complaining about Instagram and the, and what it, what it means for leisure and the experience economy, um, kind of turning experiences into products. Um, and so I think that that's something, and that's already out of date. I mean, what I said is already out of date. So I think there's kind of like a really important job for, um, people who are kind of like in it and, and like living the day to day, um, to keep connecting these things that are these like larger truths, um, that we live with to the, the everyday, like the kind of granular things that we're dealing with, um, with, and, and really try to connect that because not everyone is having the same experience. Like I, um, it just so happens that I have a surprising number of friends in their seventies. Um, and I talk to them a lot about this and, you know, like they're not on TikTok. I'm also not on TikTok. Um, but I'm like middle where like people send me TikToks. Um, but you know, like the, and so like kind of trying to like bridge that and see like the, the, the basic things that we have in common that are kind of the most important things. Well, um, being able to make it land in the experience of someone who's younger and living now. Yeah, yeah and I didn't, didn't try to, uh, I, I, I tried not to be up to date, because I'm just not, you know. <laughs> I, I'm not up to date. I, I don't watch TV. I haven't watched TV in 40 years, you know. <laughs> uh, I don't go to a lot of movies. I, I'm online all the time, and, you know, so anyway, I, you know, I'm just not even going to try that. Um, I, I, I kind of weaved a few little Grateful Dead lyrics and <laughs> stuff like that. And, and of course, you know, I went to high school in the, in the 60s. I, I did the standard American literature. I studied, you know, the Transcendentalists. And, and you, know, you didn't get into the Transcendentalists, but, you know, they were talking about time, too. Mm-hmm. And that's okay, you know, because, like I say, there are people have been talking about these things all the time, and every generation needs to say it again, fresh. So I try, and whereas me, I tried to think. I, I want this is a this is a book, man. Books last. Books. This book is going to last longer than me, you know. So I don't want it to be. Uh, I don't want to tie it down to two thousand twenty-three. Thank you so much. And that's super ultra quick, selfish question, sorry. Um, what music were you guys listening to while creating both of these, both in research and in the writing process? Interesting. Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. I don't, I don't, I think I was listening to a lot of Calyx. Um, any Calyx fans here? Berkeley College Radio? <laughs> um, I have like four Calyx t-shirts. <laughs> like all of my t-shirts are Calyx. But um, so, uh, and that's like a wide range. I, I just, I visited Calyx this past year and I found out about the grandma rule, which is you have every, per, every set has to have three genres represented in it that would be distinguishable to your grandma. <laughs> so it, it can't be like death metal, speed metal, like, you know, it has to be... <laughs> Um, three recognizably different genres. Um, and so I was listening to a lot of that, um, which was an improvement over um, when I wrote How to Do Nothing in my studio, which is very loud because there's other people in it using power tools and, and things like that. Um, someone was running an art summer camp that summer out of their studio. Um, I listened to the same harp, classical harp album, like uh, in one tab, and then the other tab was a white noise machine and like blasted it on noise canceling headphones like nonstop. Um, so this, this was definitely an improvement over that. Um, and then I also had a funny moment of um, when I was writing chapter two, which is set in a traffic jam on 880. Um, I listened to um, 
like various radio stations that had been on presets in my car. This is a pandemic, so I wasn't, I used to commute to Stanford, so, but I wasn't doing that. Um, and so I was trying to get in the headspace of like being in my car on 880 um, and like listening to radio stations and very specifically the ads, um, like radio ads of today. Um, and so you'll, you'll see that in chapter two, there's like some mentions of things that are being said in ads and those are not made up. Those are what I heard like while I was writing that part. Um, oh, I, I can't listen to anything while I'm writing, so I, I'm dead silent, Not, nothing at all. But um, what helped me write was simply getting out and walking around. Walking around, I also uh, have a regular sunbathing practice down in Snow Park, and I go there. And, um, and um, in my acknowledgments, I think, Oakland's brewers and cannabis suppliers. <laughs> uh, and o Oakland is just a it's great really town to be high in. Oakland is, it just is. You know? So, you know, every writer is different and, and everything works. You know? <laughs> Thank you so much. And I just want to say, like, if Oakland could talk, like, you guys channeled it very well. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Tony. Um, I'm a middle school science teacher uh, over by Lake Merritt. Um, so I, um, I picked up Deep Oakland immediately. I teach a lot around um, Lake Merritt. So just... It's opening up my curriculum immensely, so thank you for that. Um, my question actually is connected to both of you. Um, when I think about being an educator um, and talking about geological time, giving students schedules, time in general, when I think about deconstructing the idea of like timelines and like these grids, what do you think it looks like, like moving forward to deconstruct this idea? And you were talking about like the hegemony and like these structures. And so when we're talking about deconstructing that and teaching kids or ourselves how to do that, just thoughts about that from maybe like a scheduling aspect, yeah. and then even over like in the geological or teaching aspect, we know that like timelines and things like that can sometimes be antiquated to explain things. Yeah. Um, that's a really great and really difficult question. Um, I used to teach college students, um, and I and it was, it was at Stanford. So there's a lot. There's if you want to go to a place where time is money, um, that that is um, the place. And I was also teaching art. I was basically the art breadth requirement for non-humanities majors. So um, also like getting a lot of students coming in who are very um, sometimes justifiably concerned about the use of their time, um, sometimes obsessively. And, um, and so I wrote this op-ed in 2019. It was like a back to school op-ed and it was so hard to write for the same reason that this question is hard, where I was trying to argue for that it was important that educators create a different experience time for their students and that it wasn't we needed to make it clear that it wasn't the students individual responsibilities to make more time that we had an um, we had a responsibility to create an environment in which they felt comfortable exploring things trying things you know like this is you have to do this in an art class but ideally you would do it in every class right and um, but I, I remember that as I was writing it I kind of ran into this conceptual problem of like thinking through it just realistically for me was like, okay, well, I could decide to do that, but I'm an adjunct, so I could just not be rehired. Um, the department could decide to do that, but they want funding. The school could decide to do that, but then they would be described as not competitive, right? And it's like, like there's all these just kind of like concentric circles like out from that, and I just like didn't really know like what to do with that. And I feel like that's also just like a, a version of the problem that like all of us experience individually, or it's like, I can try to make things better in this way, um, but I'm also limited in the influence that I have. Um, and so like, I don't say any of that in the op-ed. They don't, the op-eds are not supposed to be like places where you like have a crisis. Like, um, <laughs> so like it, if you find the op-ed, it's just me basically saying that like, like within the space that you have it, as an educator, it's your responsibility to try to, try to cultivate different values and really, again, kind of like 
demonstrate to the students that like it's okay like to just kind of create a sense that like it's okay you can release your grasp on this kind of sense that time is money and but also know that you're up against so much because they're that's all around them all the time that is the message that they're getting um <clears throat> Uh, the, when you teach geology, uh, what, one skill, I don't know if they still do it, but one skill they used to consider important was going out and sketching. You know, go out to an outcrop and you, and you spend a long time just looking at it and you sketch it. You know, when, when you draw it, you see. You know, it helps you see. Uh, and I think the other tool that is, is good for... Uh, for anyone, is uh, simply what I call permission to play. You have to give yourself permission just to go out and wander around. Um, and uh, it feels great. Um, and, and teachers can do that. You know, teachers can give. That's You're all about giving permission, you know. I mean, on that note, I will say that I did get away with, uh, in a class that was supposed to be about like digital art and design, I would just take my class on a hike and we would use iNaturalist. I, I'm sure many people here know what iNaturalist is, but it's an app that you can use to identify plants. And like, I did that. Um, and that was all we did for the entire class period. Um, so, and I, I would also have students go outside for 15 minutes and just write down everything that happened. And like, they loved that. Um, and so I think like what, I think I agree at least kind of like creating, um, like spaces for observation because like for me, I mean, even now, but as a child, like I remember that's when time went away was when I was just like really ab absorbed in observing something. Yeah. I naturally wasn't walking around. Hello, uh, my name's Henry. Um, I really appreciate both of your works. Um, I guess, I guess, as you guys were talking and in, in, in the, in the things I've heard in the past from both of you, I see this strain of a uh, common strain of like being present with what is and what is actually around you. Um, it's in, in, in this world of uh, social media where everyone's looking at the most fancy, the most spectacular. They're looking at the Himalayas. They're not looking at the open, right? They're they're looking at. Um, the, the, the most exciting, the, the best. And I really appreciate the reminders in both of your works that there's beauty and infinite beauty in, in just the here and now. And I'm kind of wondering, um, I mean, do you guys, um, do you guys see that strain? And I, I guess I'm also kind of curious, do you have, I, I noticed in my own personal um, life, a, a, a meditation practice of like being present. I wonder if you guys have any type of practice like that. You guys mentioned drawing a, a couple of the questions prior to this kind of uh, alluded to those things, but any kind of habits or practices that you guys do um, to, to kind of cultivate that feeling, I think we could all do more of that. So I'm just yeah. curious. Yeah, I mean, I definitely see that as a commonality. I mean, that's why, um, like, Andrew's book is the kind of book that I that tend to buy. <laughs> um, those are the books that I like. Um, I like being given uh, new lenses on, on things that seem familiar to me. Um, I, I don't know that I have a pra an intentional practice. I have what feels like the opposite, which is that... Um, things, contemplative moments like happen to me. Um, sometimes in, they're very inconvenient. <laughs> um, like when I was teaching at Stanford, I would, um, Stanford has a lot of birds because it's near the mountains basically. Um, and I would be like already late for class. <laughs> and then it, like, I would see like the first Townsend's warbler or something of the season. And it's just like, okay, time is gone now. Um, and then it would like come back like five minutes later. I'm like five, you know, I'm even more late to class. So, um, or like just the other day, I live near one of those pedestrian stairways and I was like thinking about something really stressful. Like I just remember my brow was furrowed and then I saw a gulf fritillary butterfly. I didn't know that's what it was at the time. It was unfamiliar to me. And it had, it was just on the steps and I just like couldn't move for as long as it was there. And I'm normally a person who gets really self-conscious about things like that, but like someone walked by and I just was like, <laughs> still just like staring at this butterfly um and so I feel like like those that doesn't feel exactly intentional to me it feels like 
certain things just make that happen. And I guess there's probably maybe things you could do or efforts you could make to like render yourself more open to being surprised or, or something like that. But, um, that's just happened to me so much that I don't have any particular like habit of doing it. Um, and if anything, I need a habit of being more on time. <laughs> yeah. You have to give yourself I, I just, permission to be caught in a state of wonder. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, that's, that's a good way to put it. You know, I just like to get out. I just want to get out and walk around. Uh, sometimes I'll just grab the bus. You know, ride a couple miles and walk home. You know, but that's that's my practice. It's 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 meditative. Yeah. Um, I also love to, I also love to read old books. You know, old books are written by people who lived in entirely different worlds. You know, even though they're writing about it, like old textbooks from a hundred years ago are interesting. <laughs> Uh, old newspapers are, are really interesting. Um, uh, I'm going to steal one last tiny question. What's your favorite rock, both of you, and why? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I had to put it back. <laughs> um. Like kind of rock or individual rock? Type type of rock. <laughs> like currently, I <laughs> mean, <laughs> progressive rock. Yeah, you know. currently, currently, I would, say, <laughs> I would say chart. Not, not your retired rock collection, but yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> um, on the hot list now. <laughs> I would say chart. Chart is a favorite, <laughs> um, but that's that's right now. Which figures prominently in Andrew's book. Yes, um, and I learned a lot of what I know about church from you. Um, I, but I do have a favorite individual rock that um, is <laughs> my Instagram. I don't post that often on Instagram, but a lot of the photos going back to 2014 are of something that I labeled the skeptical rock because it has these markings on it that look like it's kind of like skeptical um, and it is a sandstone I now know <laughs> um, but uh, that's yeah anyway that's, that's I remember that now where is it I won't I can't skeptical I won't tell rock. No. <laughs> it's in the Bay Area <laughs> <laughs> Are there any more questions? Oh, yeah. And, and this, this is more a follow-up on question, Dorothy's earlier question about uh, future writing projects. And so I was uh, curious, Jenny, especially oh. after working on attention and time, how do you think now about what you're doing next and how might that have changed from yeah. previous years? Yeah, so um, right now the next thing kind of feels like a – one of those giant bubbles that you make, you know, with the thing. Like, it's just, I'm, so it's cu currently, if I had to describe it, it's something having to do with repair and habitat restoration. That is probably not its final form, um, but it's also probably not very surprising um, to anyone who's read either book. Um, the End of How to Do Nothing has a, a, a bit about dam removal. Um, that is, it's, so that's kind of like the seed of what I'm thinking about. Um, and I also, I'm just, I know that I'm interested in it as something that appears to go forwards and backwards at the same time. Um, like it's not uh, good. Like from from the people uh, from my conversations that I've had with habitat restoration people, it's you know it's not you're not resetting something back to how it used to be. You're adapting it to the present, um, but you are also having to kind of like reconstruct these relationships that have deteriorated. Um, and so from a time perspective, I find that really fascinating. And I also think we just we really need images of things getting better and improving. We absolutely do. Yes, next question. Hi. Uh, hi, I'm Abby. Um, so I was a teacher for 40 years and I just retired. Um, and in spite of trying really, really hard and getting up earlier and earlier, I was always late for 40 years. <laughs> and, and it was a problem because schools operate on uh, really strict timetables and I had yard duty every morning, so it was, it was a problem. But just recently, um, I came across the concept of time blindness, 
which is, um, I'm, I've read both of your books. <laughs> I've read both your books, Jenny, and I live, I must live really close to you. I keep expecting to bump into you. <laughs> all your landmarks are like my landmarks. Like you can Valley. find her at Rose Garden. <laughs> or Walden Park. And yeah. the cemetery. And, yeah. Yeah. Anyhow. Um, but um, I just, it, so time blindness, um, my understanding of it is just an inability to gauge how long an activity is going to take. And I, so I found this out after I retired and I, but I, so I, I have a diagnosis now, but now that I retired, I find that it's really kind of a gift. And um, I just wondered if, um, if you would come across that. Um, yeah, I yeah I I think that I um I did come across it. I didn't research it that much, um, and and I kind of wish that I had included it at the end of the book when I talk about um, crip time, which is the the notion from disability studies about um, the that perspective that that I was mentioning earlier about uh, someone who is experiencing time in a way that the the world is sort of not designed for, whether that's because it takes them longer to do something or, um, you know, the, the varying degrees to which, um, you know, none of us are labor producing machines, but, you know, some of us are able to do that more than others. Um, and some, I remember I was on forum when the book came out and someone called in about time blindness. Um, and I think that, uh, it's a really beautiful example of something that from the perspective of, of that sort of machine, like nine to five is, it's just a source of pain um, and and stress, um, but looked at from outside of that, it's actually a beautiful example of all of the different ways in which we experience time. Like it's so the way I, I use the word chronodiversity in the book, um, and that's not unique to any. We all have that, right? Like time feels different at different times for various reasons, um, and so I'm really glad that you're able to experience it in this way now. And I also. Um... I just wanted to say that I love Oakland too. I just moved here in 2012 after living in many different places, and um, I love it too. But I also like it that there's no tourists here. So um, <laughs> 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 you don't tell the Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. <laughs> well, I grew up in San Francisco, and it's kind of a problem. <laughs> Can I share uh, something you shared with me before the program began? Yeah. We went to the same elementary school. Oh. Oh. And I do want to put in, a, I know it's not about your book, Dorothy, but I, I picked it up two days ago at the library and I could not put it down. So please read Dorothy's book. It's yeah. amazing. Oh. It's called What You Don't Know Will Make a Whole New World. Isn't that the truth? And it's on sale right behind you. <laughs> I don't know if it'll be a sequel. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was sweet of you. Hi, um, I'm Beatrice, and um, I have not finished either of your books, but I'm reading them um, and greatly enjoying them. And Jenny read your first book, which was very inspirational to me. Um, I also live on Albert Street, um, and I love the little quarry um, at the end, uh, Andrew, and um, run by it every day. So it's really just changed my, um, you know, my worldview in a sense to know that that was there. Um, I wanted to ask you both just, uh, you know, because your books are so much like these timescapes in a way um, about how you thought about structuring them and where, which areas to like move to next and sort of like the chronology of them in a way. Um, well, I can say that I, um, I actually didn't have the idea, the road trip idea, until partway through writing the book. Um, it was a result of 
two very unrelated things. One was that I was in the Santa Cruz mountains with a friend, uh, one of my friends in their seventies, um, who was telling me a story while we were walking around the town. And I later realized that I could recall the whole conversation if I went on the walk again in my head. Um, and so cynically I was like, maybe people will remember things in my book more if I make it into a, a journey. Um, but, and then I was also playing Zelda <laughs> at the time, uh, the, the, at the time, the most recent, um, Zelda, a video game, um, which is also a place-based story. Things happen in certain places, and there's kind of visual foreshadowing. Um, and so, once I decided that I wanted to do that, I also knew that I wanted it to. to I wanted there to be um, a point where you turn around and you see everything that you saw on the way in from a different perspective. And then I kind of just thought about. I think I just looked at a map of the Bay Area, and I knew that it had to start and end in Oakland. Um, Pescadero is an incredibly meaningful place to me. It's like the beach that I went to. I was taken there as a baby. Um, and so I was just kind of like, okay, that's my, that's my route. And then I kind of just thought about things that are in between. Like if I'm going to talk about, uh, personal time management, um, what better place than a traffic jam on 880, <laughs> um, where <laughs> everyone's just trying to go faster. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's kind of how I, I went about it. And I tried to choose places where whatever kind of understanding of time I'm talking about is, is visible in a material way. So talking about climate dread at Pacifica, um, like looking at the kind of cliffs that are eroding, um, that's kind of what I was going for. And um, <clears throat> I, originally, I originally had a bunch of um, that the, they were walks. You know, a bunch of my chapters were walks. My editor talked me out of it, and she was right. Um, uh, there. So Why the, do you the, think she was right? She was right. Well, the, 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 now there are essays. You know, oh, they changed from from, from travelogues to essays. Uh, but the harder part was not organizing the 11 chapters. Just, you know, my first draft and the, and the third draft, my editor and I, you know, we, we were moving chapters around, which is pretty heavy duty. But I was open to it. And I spent my career as a copy editor. And uh, I would do that to authors. I would tell them that. And someone did that to me, and I thought, well, you have to trust her. Because uh, <laughs> they trusted me. Um, but basically, I, I went from the Hayward Fault. That's the big one, you know, and the one everyone wants to know about first. You know, it's on our minds. And it's the prime mover of, of everything. Everything comes from the fault. And so I did that, and then I did Lake Merritt, which kind of tied together all the first six chapters. And then after that, I kind of wandered around the landscape, thought about this and that, these are human topics. And then I finally got up into the hills and rocks and real, the real geology. So that, that was the progression. And by the end, um, if you paid attention, You've got a pretty good start on Geology 101 course. If you go to college, it'll all be, you know, you know about it. But I, there were some reviewers who said, you know, I didn't, didn't think I learned much geology. And I went, excellent. <laughs> excellent. <laughs> this is just the thing. You know? That's what makes it great. <laughs> so thank you for your question. That was a good one. Thank you. I think we're going to stop so you can purchase books, we can sign books. Um, I want to thank my two guests. Thank you first to inviting me back, but also thank Jenny and Andrew for coming and writing such great books. To make us love,